Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. Now this is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Endor and this is what's coming up on the programme today. We'll be taking a look at how the media reported uh, the recent flare-up uh, between Palestine and uh, Israel, particularly on the Gaza Strip and Hamas uh, facing the uh, uh, military of uh, the Israeli uh, authorities. We also find out uh, what Children's Radio Foundation is about and uh, the significance of it. Our regular feature back in news history uh, takes us back to the 25th of April 2002. Yeah, can you remember there was a South African who travelled to space? Can you guess who that was? Find out later on in the programme. We also have our regular feature, the uh, newspaper review. We'll be taking a look at the Sunday newspapers. Now, don't forget, you can also be a part of this programme. You can engage with us on social media using our Twitter handle, hashtag SABC Media Monitor. Okay, so please start typing if there's anything you want to share, uh, comments you want to make, and uh, we'll get to those. Before we get into our highlighted stories on the program, though, let's first take a look at one of the front pages of your Sunday newspapers this morning. And we start with the uh, Sunday Times. And uh, let's take a look at that. Well, the headline there reads, uh, Zueli's future on a knife edge. Yep, the paper's reporting on how Health Minister Dr. Zueli Mkize is fighting for his political life. Following what the paper says are revelations that his family may have benefited from the proceeds of a 150 million rand tender uh, his department awarded to his close associates. The City Press is leading with a story about uh, the President and uh, perhaps uh, uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19. Uh, they say that it could be, there could be harsh curbs coming. Uh, he may announce a level two lockdown, but they suggest that uh, um, an outright ban on alcohol sales is unlikely. So that's uh, a story to watch out for, certainly. Let's take a look at the Sunday Independent, and that's leading with a story about how uh, major nursing unions have warned that they were extremely nervous about the provision of sufficient oxygen as the country enters into a third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Sunday Tribune is reporting on how a local black-owned supermarket group uh, that's gone out of business has accused Walmart-controlled company, that's the checkout chain, of crippling its once profitable operations. But Checkout have, counts, uh, have filed a countersuit against uh, this uh, operation. The weekend Argus on Sunday is also leading with a story about the oxygen shortage supply as South Africa heads into the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The paper reports that President Cyril Ramaphosa is expected to address the nation and introduce stringent measures to curb the spread of infections. We've been seeing them rising uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Right, and the Sunday World is reporting about uh, the football club, the Mamelodi Sundowns, and they're suing their former coach, Pizzo Musimane. Uh, and uh, the front page suggests that, that the gloves are off. The paper's reporting that the club is demanding that uh, Pizzo Musimane and his wife pay back 8 million rands of uh, a sign up fee that was uh, given to the Musimani. So, yeah, that's uh, quite an interesting story that's playing out in court right now. Uh, we'll keep tabs of that one for you. Right, let's now take a look at uh, some of the trending topics on social media because, after all, a lot of you do not even bother with the papers. You get all your news on social media in 120 characters. Let's take a look and see what's uh, trending on social media at the moment. Number one trend, whites, very racially charged that one. Uh, I'll let you read it for yourself. Uh, number two, Jacob Zuma, he was in court this past week. His case has been uh, postponed, President Ramaphosa. So let's take a look at what's this, the Zuma story. And this is some of the tweets that are coming through on uh, social media at the moment. Uh, let's take a look at the first one that's come through. Right, um, <laughs> Nibana says that Jacob Zuma is the worst ever. I hope our kids won't learn about him at school. My goodness. 
Uh, du Bois, um, you are trying to, by all means, to tarnish Zuma's name, your propaganda machine. How much did you benefit from the 500 billion that you never said anything about? Okay. Uh, Zwide says, so clearly you don't see what is happening. This is not about Zuma, it's about our country. Can't you see the capitalists are about to destroy the ANC and cause havoc in South Africa? Wake up, bro. Uh, then we have uh, this one from uh, Bongi Kosi who says, uh, President Ramaphosa is far better than Zuma. We didn't have a president during his Zuma's era. The Guptas were running the country. And uh, Maps says that Jacob Zuma takes the trophy any day. And uh, Kamo says, don't be fooled. Ace Mahashule and his friends are anti Cyril Ramaphosa because he's shutting down their looting taps. That's why they're out there feeling period pains. Oh my goodness. Under Zuma, they were quiet and looting peacefully. And that's why you never heard anything from them. So, as you can imagine, this is a story that's uh, divided the country. You're either pro Zuma or anti Zuma. There's hardly seems to be anything in between on social media anyway. All right, so that's uh, Twitter, and don't forget we'll be taking a look at uh, the newspapers in more detail a little bit later on in the program. It's been more than a week now since a ceasefire came into effect between Israel and the Islamic resistance movement Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The truce seems to be holding after 11 days of fighting in which more than 250 people were killed, most of them in Gaza. Both Israel and Hamas have claimed victory in the conflict. Now, it may not be clear who actually did come out on top, especially if you follow the media uh, and to questions about media objectivity when it comes to the decades-long conflict between Israel and Palestine are not new, but this latest round of violence has seen journalism being questioned a bit more on how the story of conflict was being told. Now, accusations of bias, misreporting, or the omission of facts in order to present a particular narrative about the nature of the conflict and which side is to blame. So the question is, I guess, has the media been getting it wrong? Has the storytelling been wanting? Well, a number of commentators seem to think so. Well, I'm now joined by Middle East Bureau Chief for Russia Today, Paula Slea, and independent journalist Khadija Patel. Ladies, a very good morning to you. Let me start with you, Paula, because you wrote an article recently and you were concerned that uh, journalists were missing the facts. Take us through what concerned you. Morning, Peter. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, I, I was very concerned monitoring particularly the South African media's coverage of the recent Hamas-Israel flare-up and also the general coverage in, international, in the international arena. Mm. By and large, there seems to be an overwhelming representation of the Palestinian side of the story. And now, as a journalist, I have no problem showing the Palestinian side of the story. It's the side that had more suffering. It's the side that is party to the conflict and no doubt has to be shared. But you can't ignore the Israeli side at the expense. For example, um, for, let me give you a couple of examples. For, um, at the, on the one hand, the fact that so many people died in Gaza, and I hate playing this, this kind of numbers game because it's not fair, but many people point to the fact that Israel was behaving so brutally because more than 200 people died in Gaza. They ignored the fact that Hamas was firing rockets from civilian areas and that those rockets were indiscriminate in terms of where they landed in Israel. The fact that Israel saw a lower casualty count doesn't mean that the Israelis weren't traumatized. I mean, I've covered many stories of just how traumatic it was for mm -hmm. Israel to receive some 4,000 rockets in the space of 11 days. It just means that the Isra Israelis have the Iron Dome system, which is something that they invented, which is able to actually stop incoming rockets. At the same time, and there, there was an overwhelming coverage of the story in general, and I think that's mm -hmm. something we need to address, is why is there this, this obsession between Israel and Palestine when, for example, I reported from the... 
the Syrian civil war. I've reported from inside Lebanon, from inside Iran, from across the whole Arab Spring. You never got this kind of obsession with what was happening, mm. and you never got this outpouring of support so blatantly for the one side. All right. So, Kate, so you're saying that South Africa media uh, has been biased and uh, particularly obsessed with uh, the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but taking one side over another. That's your take on what's been happening. Yes, and, okay. and I also think that, I also think that there hasn't really been any kind of fair airtime if um, given to the Israeli side the fact that the Israeli army is very strict in terms of only being able to target military right. targets the fact that Israel gives a warning which it doesn't have to do according to international law the fact that collateral damage and as much as it's it sounds insensitive insensitive to say it collateral damage is part and parcel of what happens in war times the fact that it was Hamas who started the rocket attacks the fact that Israel was responding the fact that that whole Sheikh Jarrah the neighborhood in East Jerusalem wasn't the start of the whole conflict. It, the whole thing has been misrepresented and placed out of context. And I think, unfortunately, that is part and parcel of our faults as journalists. I think that the nature of journalism is such that we take a very, very complicated story, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we try to sum it up in television in a one and a half minute story. Okay. We can't put the context, we can't put the background, but it's no excuse for bad journalism. All right, let's ask Khadija what her take is because she's written for a number of outlets, not just here in South Africa, but uh, abroad as well. Khadija, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Welcome to the program. Um, take us through your thoughts. Do you think that uh, the story has been um, mistold, misreported or biased? Yeah, Peter, um, for me, I uh, continue to um, to do activism really um, for a process of transformation of media, particularly in South Africa. And young black journalists in South Africa will tell you that the process is ongoing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And last year, a lot of our experiences were amplified and found resonance, for example, in the scrutiny that was done of U.S. media in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests following uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, and a lot of the introspection that was done at that time probed these questions of objectivity, fairness, balance. And we cannot discuss a story like um, what happened um, in Gaza over the what was it, uh, two weeks ago, um, without also looking at the broader context of white supremacy in the media, mm. um, in global media. And in South Africa, it's something that black journalists continue to grapple with. It is an ongoing process of transformation. And therefore, the, you know, when we look at global media, I disagree with your, uh, with your guest with respect. I don't think that there was, um, you know, that there was an overflowing of empathy, for example, mm. for, uh, for the pa Palestinian experience. Um, I, dis I, 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 for mm. example, I, I believe the fact that you have an Israeli journalist, but you have me as a South African journalist, shows that there is actually a paucity of Palestinian voices in, uh, in global yeah. media. Um, I think that things are changing. I think the fact that, um, you know, the, the siblings, Muna and Muhammad al Kurd, mm -hmm. um, you know, who are, um, you know, who are, are talking, broadcasting from, um, you know, occupied East Jerusalem, um, you know, the fact that there is such a paucity of actual Palestinian voices means that there is a lack of empathy and there is a lack of fairness. We cannot mm -hmm. equivocate the Israeli uh, you know, defense force with ordinary Palestinian lives. It's, mm. it's, there, there is no equivalence here. And we have to go back, you know, to looking at what is actually happening, looking at the fact that the United Nations has called what is happening in East, occupied East Jerusalem a war crime. So, yes, there is context missing. And the fact that, Peter, as you know, and what mm. the SABC's experience is that South African media particularly is going through um, a very, very challenging um, time. We have seen restructuring. We have seen 
we've seen retrenchments happening across newsrooms in South Africa. So the only resources available to most newsrooms to actually, uh, you know, to actually cover international news is through news wires. Mm -hmm. And this does not effectively give you the opportunity to understand context, to understand history. Yeah. So yes, I agree with your, I agree with your, uh, with Paula in that, you know, on, on that on that score in that yes there you you cannot condense what's happening in a 400 word news by coming out of you know a reuters or afp or whoever it is um that you know that a lot more context is missed but at the same time um there aren't resources available um okay. all right so Katusha, let me ask you this on the ground so let me ask you then um if we don't have resources does that mean then um, we do the best we can with what's in front of us or do we find ways to make sure the story is told? Because I find myself sometimes reminding our junior colleagues when they mention the casualties in um, Gaza, I say to them, did you say the number of casualties in Israel at the same time? And it doesn't take long to check those numbers, it's just a practice. No, certainly there's always a way. Um, I've, you know, I've worked in various South African newsrooms, all of which have always been cash strapped and we always find a way around the problem. We, it is our duty, it's our obligation as journalists to find ways to tell the story. Um, we cannot, uh, you know, obviously, you know, make resources our excuse. But the point is, Peter, at the same time, the way that we tell the story is, is, is not, you know, we, we're not able to tell it as best as we can yeah. because, and this is, you know, th this is something that I keep stressing, that the, the resource, the resource constraints on South African newsrooms is a democratic deficit. It ultimately means that we will end up seeing populist narratives thrive. Right. Um, and we have to check this. We have to ensure, and this is why we need public support to ensure that there is a multiplicity of voices in South African media. All right. Paula, let me come back to you. And I, I'm curious, do you think that some of this reporting is done deliberately or is it a question of omission? So you leave out something rather than it is that you're um, trying to misreport? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, Khadija mentioned populist narrative thrives. I would argue that the populist narrative at the moment is the pro-Palestinian side of the story. And I, I disagree that because you don't have people on the ground, you can't access and tell the other side of the story. That's our responsibility as journalists. Mm. I'm not an Israel journalist, Khadija. I, I grew up and cut my teeth in journalism in South Africa. I just happen to be based on the Israeli side of the story, which is why I'm saying that a lot of what I witness here is not being represented in the international media. And that's where I see a problem with journalism. I think our profession is changing. I think you might say you want more journalists on the ground. It's not going to happen. All newsrooms across the, the world are cash strapped. I think we're having to become increasingly people who verify the news. And I think the responsibility, let's say in this conflict for South African journalists, is to look at the images coming out of Gaza and Israel, confirm firstly that they are accurate, and secondly, do the public public a service by accessing both sides of the conflict. Khadija, you used the word activism and you, t you spoke about transformation. With all respect in the world, I don't see myself as an activist and I don't think journalism, especially not so many years after the end of apartheid, should be an activist profession. I think we are a profession that informs the public. And unfortunately, that public, and I'm not talking only South Africa, I'm talking internationally, that public has put journalism at the lowest trust levels we've ever been in our history. And I think that's because we've turned journalism into a kind of activist activist profession. We're not activists. We are journalists. Our responsibility is to merely tell the story and to let people make up their own uh, their own minds. You, you if said I could come in there, Paula, if I could yeah. come in there, because you're directly, um, you know, you are making insinuations about who I am and my professionalism here. And I just want to check you here because you need to understand what I'm saying. I am not an activist for a political cause. Here. I am an activist for the truth to be told. 
That and is what I mean when I say I'm an activist. And, and for, you to, it, for you to, to insinuate anything else is disrespectful. I don't, is, mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful. You are, be, you are being disrespectful. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm, I, I'm agreeing with you that the purpose of journalism is to tell the truth. And let me tell you something. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is so complicated. There are emotions on so... It's not complicated. It's, it's very complicated. And as a journalist, if your activism is to tell the truth, you have a responsibility to tell both sides of the story. And no one can look at the recent coverage of the Israel-Gaza conflict and say that there was equal airtime and equal print time given to the Israeli side of the story. I'm not arguing the Israeli side of the story. And, and, and I found it quite insulting when you called me an Israeli journalist. All I'm saying is that this is a story that is complicated and deserves both sides to be heard. And I've monitored the South African media. And with all due respect to my former colleagues, the Israeli side of the story has not come through. You made the point that the IDF, the Israeli Israeli army um, does not equal ordinary Palestinian civilians. Who, who ever said that the IDF equals ordinary Palestinian civilians? And at the same time, I don't think Israel should have to apologize for having a strong army and being able to defend its own citizens. Why does that not come through in the media? How would you as a South African feel if you had 4,000 rockets launched at you? And, and again, I, I don't want it to become a personal confrontation between the two of us. We're both saying the same thing. We're both saying that we're journalists who are committed to telling the truth. I would, li I, I would like both sides of the story to be told. And for people who are fully informed of both sides, if they want to then criticize Israel, be my guest. If they want to right. criticize Paula, we're Palestine, running out of time. Guest. We're I'm running out of time. So let me get Khadija to, to share her thoughts. Um, Khadija, what does balance look like in a story like Palestine and uh, Israel? I think that balance is, um, you know, balance is the wrong term. I think we need to think about fairness. Yeah. I think we need to think about fairness. And I think that, um, Yes, uh, Paula is right that we're never, you know, we're never going to get into an, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity. Perhaps not in the next five years, where all newsrooms are going to be able to afford, um, you know, to have journalists on the ground, um, you know, across the world. But as it stands, on Friday, uh, Reporters Without Borders reported that Israel is now holding 13 Palestinian journalists without charge. Right? How? do we ensure that fairness is ensured when one side is holding 13 journalists who all because of their ethnicity right um and this for me is a problem that mm. i i fully agree with paula that fairness is a fundamental tenet of what i believe journalism is it is a tenet of every newsroom that i have worked in, in of all the work that i have done but it cannot come at the expense of other people. Mm. All right, so Paula, um, it's not just South Africa. I'm seeing in Britain, the BBC had to set up a complaints uh, uh, desk separate from the usual one just to deal with complaints about uh, the biased coverage. The United States is also coming under fire. Why do you think this is? I mean, you know, when I think about apartheid South Africa, people might have said that there wasn't enough stories told about the atrocities mm. of apartheid and that they might be taking a similar mm. line with uh, uh, Israel. You know, I think some of it has to be attributed to the advent of social media. So I think for the first time, conflicts are being covered without journalists being the main actors on the ground. And that is why I go back to my earlier point that we as journalists have to be verifying the information that we are receiving and not just allowing it to go out. One of the shortcomings of the Israeli army, for example, is that they're very slow in giving images to journalists. That, that back up their claims. So, for example, they'll say that they bombed a building and although there were civilians in the building, there were Hamas operatives as well. Before they release the images, they very often have to verify. There's a whole bureaucratic machinery that goes through. And so that kind of information is only released visually to the international community hours after people in Gaza have, for example, been uploading pictures. And, and again, there's that lack of context and the lack of journalists actually providing um, a kind of understanding of what's happening. I also think it's inevitable that journalists who are human beings and have their own subjectivity 
our, our part and parcel of humanity, which always has the empathy for the underdog. And I think it's much more fashionable today to support the Palestinian narrative and the Palestinian side of the story. And again, I'm not here to argue that that's wrong. I'm just here to say that if we're going to call ourselves journalists, we have to show both sides of the story. Now, Khadija mentioned that Israel is holding, um, you said, I think it was 13 journalists. But, but instead of just quoting that, we need to ask, how, you, you made the point because of the ethnicity. I doubt that there was a comment that was made by the Israeli side. Why are they holding those journalists? Are they really journalists? And, and add into the context the fact that Israeli journalists actually can't operate in Gaza. A lot of Israeli journalists would love to go to Gaza and see firsthand in the same way that you've expressed the desire that there are more Palestinian journalists on the ground, Israelis would like to have more Israelis on the ground in Gaza as well reporting. But their lives would be at risk if they did that. So again, let's not just mention facts. Let's show always that there's a counterfact and there's a context in which things belong. All right, Paula, great talking to you. Khadija, I'm going to give you a final thought. Um, Peter, I think that as South Africans, as people who have emerged from uh, a fight against apartheid as someone whose family was for you know who had was forcibly removed from their homes through the group areas act there's an onus on us to continue coverage of what's happening in um, you know in that region but to continue it i agree with paula with with nuance and understanding um and that is not going to come from our news wires. We need to actually devote resources to finding voices on the ground, to actually understanding what is happening, and not just when you know, not just when the guns are flaring, but even when the guns are silent, to actually understand what real life is like every day. The onus is on us to continue to do that, even when the guns are silent. Khadija, pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much indeed for joining us on the program. All right, so that's uh, Khadija Patel and uh, Paula Sleer talking about uh, the challenge that uh, journalism is facing in terms of reporting on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And uh, this is a conflict some people will say goes back as far as 1948 and some might say even before that when uh, Zionism uh, came into being. So uh, you're going to have to educate yourself a little bit more, read more widely to get a picture uh, because one media outlet that perhaps is not telling you the whole story. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and then after that, we take a look at uh, Children's Radio Foundation. Let's find out what that is. It's time now for us to go into our news archives and take a look back in news history. And we take you back to the 25th of April, 2002, when a uh, young Mark Shuttleworth became the first South African to travel to space as a space tourist. This is how the SABC covered this story. History has been made. South African Mark Shuttleworth has become the world's second space tourist. He blasted off to tears from his mother and cheers from fans around the country who hailed him as the world's first Afro naught. Meanwhile, Shuttleworth's adventure in space will be closely followed by students and staff at Stellenbosch University. The gathering of students and staff members at the university's student center is seen as an act of nationalism, with South Africans standing together for the country's first citizen in space. Some of them had been waiting for more than 30 minutes. South Africans, it's a proud moment since it is one of our first South Africans going up. It's very exciting. Um, my palms are sweating. There were also those who came to watch the takeoff out of curiosity, but don't really know who Mark Shuttleworth is. Mark, uh, who's Mark Shuttleworth exactly? Shuttleworth paid more than 200 million rand for the trip and will help conduct scientific experiments requested by various South African researchers. Chris Maboya, SABC, Stellenbosch University. Awe, admiration and excitement as the first Afronaut blasted off into space. South African-born Mark Shuttleworth made history at 26 minutes past eight this morning. My heart was pounding, you see. I couldn't believe it that an African really made it. An historical moment, having the first South African in space was, is, it's something rare, and we really had to be there. 
knowing that a South African can overcome things, you know, it makes you feel, I can do that one day. Shuttleworth paid about 220 million rand for his 10-day voyage above the Soyuz spacecraft and the International Space Station. It's a mixed feeling. On the one hand, we tremendously, well, we're very excited about the launch being as successful as it was, but we know that we've got 10 days more to go with this mission. Uh, there are a whole host of things that we need to do before this mission is accomplished. Shuttleworth is wearing an AIDS awareness ribbon and will be conducting a series of experiments while in space. These include HIV AIDS and genetics tests. Mark's rocket will dock with the International Space Station on Saturday. From next week, school children around the country will be able to speak with Mark and share his journey with him. Paul Isler, SABC, Johannesburg. All right, so while in space, Shuttleworth managed to speak to the then president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. President Thabo Mbeki has congratulated South African businessman Mark Shuttleworth on being the first African in space. He spoke to Shuttleworth during a live satellite link up from the Free State Stadium in Bloemfontein. Shuttleworth's dream trip of a lifetime has entered its next phase. His spacecraft has docked successfully with the Soyuz International Space Station after a two-day trip through space. After docking, Shuttleworth took time off to brief President Mbeki on life in space. Uh, Mark, what work are you doing there? Yesterday we set up the uh, first experiment, which is uh, from the University of Stellenbosch. It's a biology and uh, uh, cell studies experiment. And uh, over the next eight days here on the station, uh, we'll each be conducting separate uh, but sometimes linked scientific programs, uh, in my case, focused on uh, Africa and South Africa. What's it food like? Is it small packets of food? Or? Here comes uh, <laughs> here comes a little bit of lunch, and I could show you uh, this one uh, in uh, in Russian is Svinina uh, Skartofolum, pork with uh, potatoes. So, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, send that flying back in your general direction. I'd also like to say that I heard the uh, tragic news of uh, Mr. Tretti, and I'd like to extend uh, our condolences. I'm going to raise this glass to for us to drink uh, to South Africa on, on our Freedom Day, which indeed has created many, many possibilities for, our, for all of us to do many things, including going into space. Right, in 2006, uh, the Children's Radio Foundation was established to provide young people with tools and skills to express their ideas and share their stories. The foundation has created a network of more than 1,700 trained youth radio reporters across six countries in Africa who broadcast on local and national radio stations and via social media. Well, to tell us a little bit more about this, I'm now pleased to be joined by Kolani uh, Kondile, who is the South African Program Associate at the Children's Radio Foundation. And we also have Logan Hansen, who's a young reporter for Radio Atlantis. All right, let's uh, say good morning to you, uh, Kolani. Thanks so much for joining us. Children's Radio Foundation, this sounds like a great idea. Um, how has it been working and how many journalists would you say you've produced over the years? Wow, Peter, I think you've, been, uh, you've hit the nail on the head there with your, with your figures. Yeah. Um, and good morning to you and also to the viewers at home. So, yeah, the Children's Radio Foundation, we've been training youth reporters across the African continent um, to be radio reporters and giving them the tools and the skills to make their voices heard um, and in so doing they ignite important conversations and gain leadership experience to last a lifetime as you've rightfully said uh, they speak in local languages and in a youth friendly style interviewing community members hosting debates and bringing about local perspectives on issues that are impacting their lives so how does it work i mean you know i'm in high school right now let's say and I want to be a journalist, what do I do? Do I phone you and say, I want to be a journalist, please help me? What happens? 
Okay, so what we do is that we are in, we, we work with community radio stations, you know, across South Africa and also across other um, five countries in the African continent. And w uh, once um, in about a year, we work with local facilitators that are um, employed by these community radio stations to look after um, the youth reporters. So they would make a call, they would go to schools, they would go to community-based organizations, um, recruiting um, young people that want to be um, change makers in the communities because we're not so much interested in young people who can articulate themselves well, you know, who speak, um, you know, who speak very well and are very, very confident. We're interested, you know, in the young people who want to change their communities, who want to raise awareness about issues that they care about. And then once we've done that, <clears throat> we would train them um, to have these radio um, skills and, tool uh, and, and tools, and um, we would train them to produce and broadcast radio shows and would support the project with resources, production guides, and information to enable um, high-quality reporting. And the youth, in turn, would report on these important issues and, and broadcast radio shows that can stimulate dialogue and also um, connect young people to opportunities for advancement and allow them to interact and learn from each other. Okay, well, let's find out a little bit more from one of those uh, young reporters, Logan Hansen. A very good morning to you. Um, I know that you work at uh, Radio Atlantis. Take us through your experience working with the Children's Radio Foundation. So good morning, everyone. Like I said, I'm Logan Hansen. And working with the Children's Data Foundation has really gave me a lot of confidence and experience within my community. It has made a platform open for me to speak to youth and to create awareness on topics that youth's not allowed to normally speak about, that people find that we as the youth are too young to know anything about. And therefore, it gave us a platform to go out there and actually make a difference within our community, speaking on topics like climate change, gender-based violence, and gun violence within our communities. So tell us some of the things that you learned about journalism that have helped you do the work that you're doing. So it has definitely taught me about how to go out there and how to spread a message within the yeah. community. So we were 15 years old and 14 years old when we started, and some of our youth reporters still are that age. It's very difficult to spread the message without the youth thinking that we are superior to them or that we are actually not knowing what we are speaking about. So it has taught me a lot about how to go out there and actually spread a message in a meaningful way, which it will have an impact within my community. But it's also taught me a lot of confidence and learning me so many communication skills that I can still use in my daily life even when I'm not within the program. All right so is storytelling and journalism something that you're going to stick with for the rest of uh, your career maybe? At the moment I really love what I'm doing as yeah. being a radio presenter but in the future I'm not sure it's still something I would like <laughs> to pursue as it is still there and it's always an option for me since the skills I learned at the program and being a radio presenter at the moment it's skills that I can use in my daily life and in any job I do so no matter what I can always take the skills that the Children's Radio Foundation has taught me and take it forward within anything that I do. All right, so I'm going to come back to you to tell us a little bit more about some of the stories that you've told. But let me go back to you, uh, Klalani. Um, I, I suppose that the challenge is uh, identifying these candidates and uh, following through in terms of what they do after you've trained them. Have you been able to keep tabs on them and do they stay connected to you? Yeah, um, we do stay connected, um, Peter. Um, <clears throat> we have what you call here in the organization um, learning journey, you know, that tracks a young person's, um, a young journalist, um, what they're learning throughout. And once they, um, once they graduate, they become our alumni and we expose them to further, um, to other opportunities that they might, um, that they might need in the future. As you know that, um, in South Africa, with the rate of um, unemployment being at 43% and rising, there is a constant need for young people to be exposed to opportunities. Um, and our one of our partners, the TG Marie Trust, has identified that the transition from high school to employment is a critical time in the life of a young person that can make or break um, their future. So without community-based support, they could be locked out of the economy of the economy in the long term.
So in our youth transition initiative, young youth reporters have identified specific bottleneck that hold them back from seizing opportunities in their communities. We all know the high cost um, of searching for a job and the need for a centralized place where jobs are advertising, you know, advertised at the community level and the lack of focus on developing soft skills in schools. They've also reported on both small and solvable, um, both small and solvable problems and larger systemic issues to get adults and young people working together to develop shared goals and to turn the tide on unemployment. So yes, you know, we, we do want to um, continue doing this and um, being able to, 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 to keep our young reporters uh, involved. And what you've noticed over the past two, three years or so, Peter, is that the youth that have started with us at a very early age, such as um, Logan when she was 14, when she started, they now take on leadership opportunities right. within the program themselves. They become local facilitators because they've learned all these valuable skills that um, Logan has said and are able to engage and relate to other younger, pe uh, younger people that want to join the program as well. And yeah, I think um, uh, across South Africa, I think there's about eight or 10 um, local facilitators who are, you know, younger than 25 and are able, you know, to share the skills um, that they've learned um, when they were uh, youth reporters themselves. And we've taken on one or two of them to um, actually join the program, to, to join us um, here at the office in, in Cape Town. And others have been absorbed by some of, the, um, so some of our colleagues in the development sector. I would imagine also that, uh, you know, the kids come from different communities, they have different challenges that they're facing. Uh, is this something that you need to take cognizance of with your training and, and um, uh, alter it or, or tailor it uh, for particular circumstances? Um, language is the biggest factor, Peter, um, because, you know, um, young people are spread across South Africa, and we, as you know that, you know, South Africa is a diverse country um, with 11 official languages. So each and every single time we go to a community to train, we are aware that, you know, um, our training needs to be, we, we need to adapt it to suit um, that space. And also, you know, we often view in the organization that, you know, um, we, you know, um, um, young people also come from different, um, you know, um, different homes and uh, different homesteads. So we need to be very aware of the issues that they are facing um, in, in, in those communities and be able to put ourselves, you know, in their shoes so that we can um, develop, you know, training um, that, 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 that's adaptable and that's also relatable for them. All right, Logan, let me come back to you. And I'm just wondering, the stories that you tell sometimes can be difficult, I guess. You know, I've uh, uh, been to Atlantis a few times, and I know that uh, that community has had some of challenges over the years. How difficult is it sometimes to tell difficult stories? So most of the time, since I do come from Atlantis, and it's a community that's filled with gangsterism and gun violence, and that is one of the topics that we cover at the Children's Radio Foundation. So it makes it really difficult to actually speak about it, because when we do go out into our community to get Vox Box or to do anything with them, we have to hear the sad stories, and we have to communicate with the parents on, are we allowed to do this? Are we allowed to present this on air? Are you willing to share your story? Mm -hmm. So it also comes to us having sympathy with the people with the parents who have, might have gone through gun violence or anything like that in our community. So that's one of the challenges, but we also tend to face that people don't really want to listen to the youth, which is also one of the major challenges that we face coming out here, wanting to do good in our community, but going out to do box pops and getting robbed or getting hit or like just us being injured in any sort of way. So sometimes that will happen, like we got dropped once when we went out to do Vox Box. But those are just some of the many few challenges that we actually face when trying to do what we love doing. Have you faced challenges like harassment? Because we know that female journalists sometimes, unfortunately, uh, have a, quite a hard time out there in the field. Is that something that you faced and uh, have you been able to find ways to manage it if it does happen? So most of the times when we do outreaches in the community, like for instance, if we would go to school, I've only had it once when it was actually kids and I haven't had anything with a grown up yet, like a grown man or any such like that. But one of our youth reporters, including me, we sometimes have it with only small kids where they don't mm. understand that we are there to actually 
like spread a message and we are here to bring positive like to teach them something but then they are there about oh can i have your number you look like the stuck they are always their minds are somewhere else and it's sometimes hard for us to stand in front of a class or a lot of people and try to spread a message but yet we have to have that constantly in our mind like do i look right am i not offending anyone is anyone going to think that i am here to do something else so yes it has happened a few times but only with younger kids mm. Do you think your stories are making a difference and is it bringing young people to be interested in news because they're hearing it from young people as well? Yes, I do think the fact that we are youth making a difference within our community for the youth. So they normally say we are the youth. Um, we are the youth spreading a message by the youth. Because I believe since the youth is hearing it from us, they see that not only can we make a difference, but they can be part of that change. And they find it so interesting that you are only 15 or 18 years old. How do you get to do this? Where, do, where can I sign up to do this? We've had many incidents at school when we go to school to do like outrageous and they're like, oh, but you my age and you are here doing something I would love to do one day and something I dream of doing like being a radio presenter how can I actually get involved with that and how can I also be part of the change within my community and not just be here listening to you even though they love doing that and we love going out and working with them sometimes there are so many children that see that what we are doing and they want to be part of the change as well. Logan, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm very impressed by you, and I hope that uh, maybe you can come work with us at the SABC in the near future. Thank you so much indeed. It's been great talking to you. Thank well. you so much. Thank you for having <laughs> me, and sure, anytime, just let me know. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. And then, Kulani, uh, we've run out of time, but very briefly, you must be quite proud when you see these young cadets coming through and then the confidence that they grow into. Yeah, we definitely are, Peter, and, you know, it's something that we value so much as an organization. We are of the view, you know, that um, when young people are given opportunities and, and, and tools, they can do exactly um, what um, Logan is doing in her community and many other young um, reporters across South Africa. As we all know, that they are facing um, difficulties um, around violence, gender-based violence, as, you, as, as you've mentioned, you know, mental health um, issues. So when they rise above these challenges, it gives us, you know, um, great pride and we, you know, we we begin to be hopeful that you know the, um, the country is it will be in safer hands moving forward. Olani, thank you so much, and great work that you guys are doing at the uh, Children's Radio Foundation. Well done, keep it going. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you to the viewers at home as well, and thanks to the parents for you know allowing us to work with their children. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a great Thanks. story. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll start taking a look at your newspapers. Welcome back, you're still watching Media Monitor. Now we take a look at your local newspapers and uh, some of the stories that have been on the front pages. And to take us through that is uh, independent consultant and journalist uh, Khadija Patel. Thanks so much, Khadija, for joining us again. All right, so um, I think the Sunday Times grabbed your attention. What's on the front page there? Yeah, so we're seeing the fallout from uh, the Daily Mavericks reporting earlier this week about the digital vibes tender um, at, in the Department of Health. Sunday Times reporting um, some new information there that there are uh, some differences, shall we say, within the digital vibes group. There seems to be a fallout among the directors there. Um, and of course, this, uh, you know, all eyes now on Dr. Mkiza himself. Yeah, and I suppose the challenge here is, you know, when you start comparing it to um, Bandele Masuku and his uh, misfortune uh, at Gauteng department, he said that he didn't know. Zolim Kiza says he didn't know, but they seem to be getting treated differently. Yeah, and I think this is, uh, the ch the, you know, this is going to be the challenge for President Ramaphosa. How indeed does he respond to this um, of course the dr mkiza has been lauded for you know for leading south africa's response to the covid 19 pandemic um, he's been a key ally i would say in um, mr ramaphosa's faction um, but uh, you know the real test of whether you know you know whether the new broom does indeed sweep clean comes now um, there you know i think the most you know the the most telling evidence against uh, 
Dr. Mkhize came on Friday um, when the Daily Maverick reported that, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, that there seems to be some evidence that both his son, uh, you know, received some portion, um, you know, of the money through this tender as well as uh, renovations to a home owned by um, mm. his family trust. Th those two little nuggets, um, you know, on top of, you know, the way that the tender was signed, um, who knew what, when, um, and, you know, the astronomical amount of money charged for really commonplace events, you know, events that should have been done by department staff themselves means that Dr. Mkhize is under a lot of pressure and it's going to be interesting. And, you know, Peter, I think um, you may have also, I think you did show, um, you know, the City Press headlines, you know, City Press reporting that the president should be announcing new restrictions um, as South Africa enters the third wave. We, the pandemic continues. Mm -hmm. um, the vaccination rollout, while it's happening, is quite slow. Um, not all South Africa's fault. Certainly, there is a global shortage of vaccines. But, um, Dr. you know, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, our health minister being distracted in this way mm -hmm. certainly is not helpful. And certainly, you know, we've got, you know, it, it is... It's a problem in that, you know, it has an impact on uh, the public health response to the pandemic. We cannot have a health minister who is distracted at this point in time. Mm. And I suppose this, and it's a difficult one, when you say, I don't know, um, as a senior executive, um, is there a question that maybe you ought to have known, uh, particularly when it concerns members of your family? I mean, we had, um, I think, Marcelo Coco at ESCOM saying that he didn't know that his daughter had a contract, and questions were raised there as well, but, you know, you're, you're acting CEO, you ought to have known. You know, Peter, you know, even when I was at um, the Mail and Guardian, the number of stories that emerge in South African media, um, you know, about this kind of issue, fundamental conflicts of interest um, that arise with uh, you know, with people in government, there has to be, you know, there has to be some, you know, some intervention within the ANC mm -hmm. that accepts that there are fundamental, there is a fundamental conflict of interest when a family member of a politician is also doing business with, um, you know, with the government department that that politician is in charge of. It's, it's not that difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. And yet this is something that happens almost every week in local government, national government. And, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, this is a show that is, you know, that, that is about media coverage. And I think that if it wasn't for, you know, the continued media um, scrutiny into government contracts, a lot of this would just, you know, be continuing. It was, and we have to use this moment to actually you know, demand change in procurement processes, in the rules around how government actually does business. Khadija Patel, thank you so much indeed. Great talking to you. Thank you for your insights, uh, not just on the papers, but that interesting conversation we had earlier on today. Thank you so much indeed. Cheers. All right, okay, that's uh, independent consultant and journalist Khadija Patel taking us through our newspapers. And that's where we come to the end of our program today. Thanks very much for tuning in and watching Media Monitor. We'll see you again at the same time next week. But in the meantime, please be careful out there. Follow those uh, COVID-19 protocols. It could save a life, maybe even yours.